Hello, everybody. We're back for uh, this last uh, half day about uh, APIs uh, at the APIs interface uh, to talk about a really important topic that really changed the industry over the last six, seven years, which are API specification. The way to describe APIs in a machine readable way that enable a lot of automation and a, a huge ecosystem of, uh, uh, um, of a software that is able to read these machine readable uh, definitions to generate design, testing, documentation, and many uh, security, sometimes uh, API management um, uh, options, uh, right? So we will talk about uh, these topics. And I I'm glad to introduce our first speaker, uh, Daryl Miller, who is a board member of the Open API Initiative that's now managing uh, the evolution of the spec. Hello, Daryl, how are you? Hey, Mehdi, I'm here? doing good. Perfect. So if you are able to find the sharing screen button, uh, we would be able to hear uh, your talk about the state of the OpenAPI initiative and also introducing OpenAPI specification 3.1, brand new one. Okay, and now I am sharing my screen and yeah, my this video. Is event. This is a remote event. This Perfect. Is Thank you, Carol. You have 25 minutes. Enjoy your time and stage. Awesome. Thanks, Maddie. So we're going to talk about the Open API specification and the Open API initiative, its past, its present, and its future. So the Open API initiative has become the most successful industry organization in the API space. Our members range from the biggest companies in the world to startups with big ideas. Uh, if we actually get more members, the icons on this slide are going to end up getting too small to actually read. Fortunately, we have one more space on the bottom row to add the logo for our latest member, which is Postman. And Postman are going all in on Open API as their API is their official API description format, and we're really excited to have them officially join the Open API initiative. The Open API specification has proven it's not just a passing fad technology. Open API became hugely popular with its 2.0 release back in 2014 when it was still named Swagger. Uh, in 2017, we released a major update with uh, version 3.0. And since that time, we've released several minor patches, just making corrections to language and just clarifying certain things. And we've worked on some new work, uh, like alternative schemas, which is currently being piloted with implementations just to make sure that we get it right before we actually include it into the official specification. And in parallel to that, we have been working on uh, version 3.1, which is our latest update. And yes, it is almost here. Uh, we have an RC0 release at the moment. Now, this particular update to the spec, it isn't going to feel like a big change, but there was a lot of hard work done between our community and the JSON schema community in order to solve some significant challenges that our users are facing when trying to build effective API management processes. So let's talk about that. Let's talk about what is new in OpenAPI 3.1. And it's mostly minor stuff, but I'm going to save some good stuff in for the uh, for the end. We'll start with the info object. It's where you describe about your API, just give it some kind of tech contextual information. And we'd had feedback from the community that a lot of uh, objects on uh, in an open API description have a summary and description. We had a description. And there was a request to also add summary. So we already have title. So think of sort of summary as the subtitle. Title's really short, summary's a little bit longer, but just plain old text. And then we have the description that allows you to do a markdown type of content. Another piece that was changed in the info object is adding an identifier to the license. We used to just allow you to give a URL so that somebody could click on that URL and go and find out about the license that your API is permissioned with. Uh, but that wasn't great for machine readable scenarios. So we have introduced uh, an identifier property, which uses the SPDX identifier for machine processing. And if you follow that link uh, at the bottom, you'll see there are a thousand and one different 
licenses for every single possible scenario you could possibly think of. So they're just a couple of little things that are added into the info object. Something that is a lot bigger and more significant is a new top level element that we have added called webhooks. Now, webhooks really are just another way of doing callbacks. Again, this was a community contribution and uh, the, the feel was that callbacks are fine. Callbacks are where you have some kind of operation and you can go and register to receive a callback at some later point in time. But some scenarios exist where there is no API for actually registering for the webhook. It's actually done in an out of band context. So webhooks allow this out of band. It's a new top level object. And within it, you can basically specify a path item, just like you do with a callback. And we got to the situation it's like, well, it's kind of nice to have all of these things at a top level because that's great for documentation to see all of the callbacks. But then maybe there is also a place where you can register them. So we said, well, if you want to have it there twice, we don't want folks to have to be able to specify it twice. So we introduced path items as a new component section so that you can define reusable path items and then just reference that path item from either the webhook or in the callback where the uh, subscription endpoint is. And you'll notice in this little fragment of Open API, we don't actually have a paths property at the top level. That used to be a required property. And we've intentionally removed that property uh, from being required. Uh, and this makes it easier to define well-defined Open API descriptions that are just reusable libraries. So if you have a set of components that you want to define, that you're going to reuse across a set of different APIs, you can define a well-defined document that won't give you any errors and you don't have to put an empty paths in there where everybody looks and goes, why are there no paths in this object? It's like you don't have to include the object at all. So moving on, references. This is going to be a popular uh, concept. If you notice up here, Next to the dollar ref, we actually have a summary and a description. And there's a reason why we've added it here. Uh, we'll talk more in a minute about JSON schema and the changes that we're making about adopting new capabilities that are available in JSON schema. And one of the things you can do in JSON schema is there's a certain set of properties that are considered annotations, but not constraints, that you can sit alongside uh, dollar refs within a JSON schema. And so in order to match that capability, we've started to allow some properties to sit alongside the $ref. So if you are reusing some component, but you want to add some additional descriptive content to say this thing that we're reusing means this within this particular context, uh, then you can now add summary and description. And we're still open to the idea of adding potentially some other properties that can sit alongside dollar ref. We have provided guidance that says anything that you provide at that top level should override, i.e. completely replace whatever is defined within the thing that you reference. But we didn't put it a must. We, may, we recognize that there's maybe some tooling scenarios where somebody might actually want to present both pieces of information, aggregate both the reference description and the top level description. We'll leave that in the hands of the capable tooling people. And another top level entity that, or another significant entity that we have enhanced is around the area of security. And we have a lot of other work going on with regards to security. We're just not quite ready to embed it in the spec, but these are a couple of easy items that we figured we could get into a minor release. One of the things that we've added is a new type of security scheme called mutual TLS. So if you use client certificates in order to ensure that you're getting an authenticated connection, you can specify the type mutual TLS. 
And of course, as is all with security schemes, you can combine different security schemes. So you can say it's mutual TLS and it requires an auth key or it requires some other kind of scheme. And we've gone a little step further in that if you, in the past, you used an OAuth protocol for a security scheme, we allowed you in the requirements object to provide an array of scopes that a limp said you can access this particular operation if you have had the application is consented to these particular scopes. But we didn't allow you to use those con that concept unless you were using OAuth or OAuth2. Uh, so we have now extended that. And so now you can create an array of strings underneath the security requirement. In this case, I've mentioned called client certificate as a security scheme. I've said you need the to do dot write either role or claim or whatever your security scheme calls those things in order to be able to access that particular uh, operation. And there are a whole set of other smaller items, clarifications, debatably, you might call them enhancements, things like allowing request body for all HTTP methods. In the past, we explicitly said, no, if it's a get, you can't pass a request body. Um, in some ways, we're becoming less and less opinionated as to how uh, you should build your HTTP API. It's not recommended to send bodies along with, po with get methods and delete methods, but we recognize that there are some folks that do do that, and we don't want them to be able to stop describe, being able to describe their particular API. We had a little boo-boo in the encoding object, and the encoding object is kind of this funky thing that allows you to use specify further serialization information on top of a JSON schema that is being used to describe form data. Um, kind of have a hoping that that may be able to go away with some of the new stuff that's coming in JSON schema. But uh, for those people who really need to describe URL encoded forms or multi-part form data, we'd forgotten to say multi-part form data was okay. So we've added that back in. So if you are if you are a big user of form data, you'll appreciate that extra wording in the spec there. Uh, we closed some gaps. We had an issue with path path item parameters where we didn't actually say you actually have to define those path item parameters and not just kind of leave them hanging. Uh, so we've closed some loops there. And we've removed some definitions of some formats. Uh, we had that have the notion of types and formats that we borrowed from JSON schema. And uh, we were explicitly saying, well, byte and binary format mean this explicit thing. We've taken those out because as we'll discuss in a minute, we are deferring more and more of these kind of modeling things, specifically to JSON schema. And we're staying out of the way of having opinions in that area. Now, which kind of brings us to the conversation around versioning. And when we introduced version three of the spec, we knew that we needed to do a better job of, of communicating to people, okay, this is what it means when we introduce a major version. This is what it means when we introduce a minor version of the spec. This is what a patch version means. And we followed that uh, in the last version using Sember, but it, continues to cause us challenges. And uh, because a spec isn't like a deployed piece of tooling, it doesn't have the same characteristics. And a change that might be considered breaking to one set of tooling may have absolutely no impact on another set of tooling. And we attempted in 3.03 .03 to actually add some wording that would make it very clear that if you bumped a spec up to a new minor version, that you could take an existing open API description that you had written, just change the version, and it would be still valid in tooling. And that is something that we still want to encourage because we understand that companies are creating large number of docs. And if we say, oh, in order to bump this up to this new version to be able to use a new feature, you're going to cause a whole bunch of other things to all of a sudden not validate properly. That becomes a maintenance headache. So that is still 
a, a key part of our guidance is that minor versions shouldn't require you to go and start changing your uh, uh, updating your descriptions. They should be forward compatible. The problem when we ran into 3.1, we ran into some additional issues, especially around the work we were doing around JSON schema that were in very, very specific scenarios for what we perceived would be very small number of customers and literally so small, we haven't actually found tooling yet that exists that would break the scenario. We said, yes, in theory, it could be breaking, but in reality, it isn't. So we had a large debate about whether to move to 3.1 or to move to 4, and we didn't feel that version 4 accurately reflected the set of changes that were going into this version of the spec. And so we made a decision, and it wasn't supported by everybody. We literally had to take a vote. Um, and some people are going to be upset, and some people are going to be happy, but we made a decision to move forward and actually ship something, because that is what is important. Um, the 3.1 will ha has some scenarios that might, in strange, obscure scenarios, cause somebody to break. Um, the important thing from our perspective is minor means it's not significant changes. Major means that we are making significant changes. And we're going to do our best moving forward to clarify the impact of the changes that we are making in the spec. But you can look at major and minor and use native language to mean that. Don't go back to this Ember spec because we aren't, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Precisely following Semver for this specification. So I've talked a little bit, a lot. I mentioned, hinted about JSON schema. What are we trying to do with JSON schema? So the idea here is that in the past, we had OpenAPI 3 as a description. We had this concept called OpenAPI schema within it which was almost exactly the same as JSON schema draft four. We had a few minor differences. And that wasn't a problem if you were using open API tools that had internally built schema tools that understood the specific differences of open API schema. But as soon as you try to use standard JSON schema tools, which a lot of people were trying to do, it didn't always work. And you'd get false positives on failures. And it was just a problem. And the community spoke loud and clear. They want us to just, A, support later versions of JSON schema, and they want us to be completely compatible. And so moving forward in 3.1, we don't have other than as a name, a definition of open API schema. We literally just say this open API schema is JSON schema draft 2019-09 or later. And the folks who are building tools, open API tools, they will defer to JSON schema tools. I mean, they have a choice. They could embed their entire own version of a JSON schema parser inside their open API tools, but it's more likely that open API tooling will just take a dependency on JSON schema tooling to actually do all of the work around JSON schema. And so that means we do not have any more weird open API specification exceptions around oh, well, you, can, you can't have an array for a type and read-only works differently in this case and write-only works differently. We don't have, you don't need to use nullable. You can use the JSON schema concepts for this. And we just defer to uh, JSON schema when it comes to formats. It means we can start using concepts like ID at a JSON schema so that you can have a path independent way of referring to other schemas so that you can move things around on your file system and they don't necessarily break. And as I mentioned about encoding, JSON schema now has this content media typing, content media type and content encoding to help describe serialization information that we will start to have, our users will now be able to leverage and maybe in the future and maybe in version four, we can get rid of that encoding object because it's really out of scope for, for what open API really should be trying to do. So looking forward to the future, 
Uh, we have a whole bunch of things that is on our backlog of stuff to work on. Uh, we have overlays, which is a concept that we have spent quite a lot of time looking into when we have a proposal uh, on how we might do this. And this is the idea of having a separate document, and we probably will uh, release it in a separate spec that allows you to apply a set of changes on top of an API description. And there's a whole set of really interesting scenarios uh, that will make that will be lit up by having this notion of overlays. Reusable groups, uh, being able to dollar ref to only one thing is kind of a pain when you have a bunch of parameters that are used on every single operation, and we really want to find a solution to that. That's high on our list of priorities. I mentioned before about alternative schemas. The spec is nailed uh, is is down in our proposals uh, section of the uh, GitHub repo, and we're looking for more community feedback from people who are actually building tools to say, yes, is, this is the right design before we bake it into the spec. Uh, we continue to have feedback about paths, optional paths, multi-segment paths. We have folks who want to be able to distinguish operations based on query parameters. As I mentioned, in, from a security perspective, digital signatures encryption is a big topic uh, that we are working towards enhancing uh, OAS to be able to say, yes, this particular operation requires a payload and you need to sign that payload or you need to encrypt that payload with this set of security parameters. And we have other areas around discovering security credentials to make it easier for tooling to figure out how to get that token in order to be able to call your API, in order to make those kind of try it experiences much, much easier. You'll find a lot of this information in the repo uh, on GitHub, OAI Open API Specification. And more specifically, uh, we do do a lot of discussion in issues. Uh, we just find that as an idea starts to coalesce, uh, issues tend to get fragmented and very, very long and difficult for people to read. So we've moved to a process that we, we borrowed from the Swift language, uh, which is this notion of proposals. And so here we have these very specific documents with the template that describes the scenarios of the problem that we're trying to solve, the potential solution, and we use these as working documents in order to find a solution that is going to work and we can move it quickly into the actual specification. And our plan is hopefully uh, to very quickly, once we get the overlays work done, start working on an Open API 3.2. Uh, speaking of uh, having conversations about API specifications, uh, this is just a little shout out to the API specifications conference that is happening in September. I expect to see a lot of the folks that I'm seeing speaking here and attending here uh, will hopefully be joining us in the API specifications conference. Our call for papers is out at the moment. You can go to apispecs.io there. And this event is really intended to provide a forum for people who are either using specifications and have feedback or writing API specifications uh, to be able to network and share their ideas is and learn from each other. So please, if you have some ideas you want to share, uh, submit for the call for papers. And with that, uh, there's a couple of minutes left. I want to open it up for questions. Yeah, thank you very much, Daryl. Uh, yeah, one minute and a half for questions. Uh, we have questions like, does JSON schema work on things other than JSON? If not, any plans to help describe representation that are in JSON in open API specifications? Absolutely, and this is what alternative schemas proposal is. It is an idea to be able to point to any other kind of schema type, whether it's XSD, whether it's a protobuf schema, and uh, that's exactly what uh, that alternative schema is designed to enable. So go over to the GitHub repo, go take a look at that alternative schemas proposal. Yeah. Uh, also, one question uh, uh, is about uh, other specifications. So at the API specific specification conference, you work with all other specs, right? Open API initiative is not just about open API specs, right? I, I, absolutely not. We can all learn from each other. And this is our real intention. Uh, last year, we had representatives from uh, JSON API, OData, GraphQL, um, I'm going to end up forgetting a bunch of specs here, but uh, 
a, a wide range of people who are just interested in this idea of being able to have machine processable documentation contracts that can help to enable tooling and make the API lifecycle just that much easier. Uh, whatever we can do to be able to share ideas and have consistency. Well, we had Fran, of course, from Async API. Uh, this is just a great example of two groups working together and sharing concepts and not introducing more stuff that users have to learn when we are able to share things. Perfect. So we see you in uh, around one hour uh, for a panel about API specification. Thank you very much, Daryl. Uh, uh, looking forward to it.